valid point. I was trying to stick to simplicity, but he's, he's 100% correct. It was a Bitcoin, uh, yeah, what's it? Bitcoin improvement protocol. Yeah. Um, that so in that sense, say originally you had a Trezor and you just hated using the Trezor and you wanted to buy something else, and, and that can be anything. You could even go to a paper wallet or a web wallet or whatever you wanted. That 12-word phrase will recreate that private key. Yes. Can I put that on two wallets, two hardware wallets at the same time? Yeah. If you put the have all those two wallets, if you lose one? So no, you would you'd rather have two backups. So you would rather have your 12 word C phrase written on two different things, stored in two separate places. Gotcha. That way, if you happen to lose your treasure, and you just get another one, versus having two treasures because they're going to have the same information on them, so it, they're only 100 bucks, but from the same perspective, you could write out it on a piece of paper for free. Uh, the other is this, this was a kind of a big, a big changer with that Bitcoin improvement protocol, uh, 39, I think Alex said, is say I'm, I'm fleeing a really dangerous country and I can't take anything with me. And I can't take my money out of my bank, I can't take any of my worldly possessions, I'm just fleeing. And this is obviously a worst case scenario, hopefully we won't ever see this in Canada. But what's easier to remember? If I said to everybody, you have 15 seconds, write one of these down correctly. There's obviously this one's gonna be a little easier unless you really struggle with spelling. Um, this, when I, when I transpose it, it's taken exactly out of mastering Bitcoin. I timed it. This took me almost 47 seconds. This took me about 13. And when I went back to double check this, I did mess it up. I put two A's instead of one. Uh, I might have actually taken it out. It might still be wrong. Um, so that's the idea between, behind, sorry, the, the seed words is they're just they're easier to remember they're easier to transpose and you've got less opportunity for catastrophe so this is the life cycle of bitcoin transaction i'm not going to go through this step by step by step um, like i said the presentation will be made available and you can go in and kind of check this out at your own at your own pace um, so an unspent transaction output um, a lot of people will tell you that the blockchain is basically just a UTX I was at. And it's saying that there's all this Bitcoin that could be spent, just none of it's been spent yet. Because if I send Bitcoin to Amber, then I have unspent, an unspent transaction output, or Bitcoin. And when I send it to her, now she has it. So she can turn around and send it to Joseph. And so there's just, just constantly this output of Bitcoin that can be spent. That's where the input comes in. And now the input is all it's saying is, does Rodney own and control that Bitcoin? Does he have enough Bitcoin that he can actually send one to Amber? No, he's only got half a Bitcoin, so that transaction is not valid. It would get tossed out. Uh, the Bitcoin network, this is not technically accurate. Okay. How can you um, own Bitcoin but not control it? How can you own Bitcoin but not control it? Um, because everybody, because everybody as a group has it's it goes back to the example of as I was saying before, where all of us are maintaining a copy of a ledger in here, and Joseph tries to alter it. Um, you 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 need more computing power than technically is available at this point in time to control or take over Bitcoin. Um, but at the same time, like I said, I've got, I've got hardware or mobile wallet, like Bitcoin wallets on my phone. So I own this phone, I control the keys, I own that Bitcoin. So it's, nobody can own Bitcoin capital B, if you remember back to that slide, but anyone can own Bitcoin little b. So anyone can own the currency, but no one can own the network. Cool. And yeah, this is not an actual truth. 
as far as I can. Um, so different types of notes. So a full note. This is, as I said before, every transaction that's ever occurred, ever. And the full transaction data, which isn't a lot. It's now upwards of kind of two megabytes per block. Um, and I think it's pushing, I think somewhere between 25 and 50 gigabytes. Do either you guys know? The, the, the whole yeah. ledger? It's, it's not uh, 300 gigabytes. Right? Is it 300 gigabytes yeah. now? Okay, I'm way off. It's, I'm, I'm thinking of Ethereum that pushed over a terabyte recently, so. Um, which kind of tells you the amount of transactions if each block is only somewhere between two megabytes or less. Um, anyways, full node has everything. A routing node is, it's all it is is the connection to the network. Every node will have a routing node. It's inherent and it is, isn't really mentioned anywhere outside of mastering Bitcoin. Um, a wallet, an SPV node, or a lightweight node. So this is a partial set of the UTXOs. So what it does is it keeps the header line, which contains specific information about the previous block, the, um, the nonce, which is the answer to the really, 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 really complicated math question. And all it does is it uses a very, very, technical that I, I can't touch in an hour, if I could explain it at all, um, Merkle tree system to basically look back and verify using the information within the header, which is possible. I will touch on it very briefly um, as we get further in. And then mining, is, <coughs> again, it's, it's also a full load. It just runs additional software on top of it to try and solve that really, really, really complicated math question. The Bitcoin Relay Network, so if you think about all of us sitting in a room here right now, and we're trying to update that spreadsheet every 10 minutes, it's probably not gonna be too hard because we're all right here. We're all on similar networks, there would probably be minor deviations. But when you're in a race for 12 and a half Bitcoin every 10 minutes, the competition is fierce, it's expensive, and they created what is now called the Fast Internet Bitcoin Relay Exchange. Um, Macarolo did it, and these are the points where that information is disseminated from. If you go and look at where most of the mining nodes and full nodes are, are located, a large chunk of them will be surrounding those dots because that's the closest that you're gonna get to where the, the information is kind of being provided. So it gives you like fractions of a second of an advantage, but again, it gives you a tiny advantage. So SPV and lightweight nodes. So as I said before, um, they, they do keep the list of all of the transactions that occurred. They just don't keep the full set of transactions. They just keep thousand times. I th think it's a hundred bytes of data. Um, then what they do is they refer on full nodes. So they'll bounce information off based on the information that they have in the block header to say, is this correct? Is this correct? Is this correct? That's why anyone who uses a full node um, is very privacy centric and wants to operate in a truly trustless fashion that Bitcoin's kind of meant to be, because they don't have to rely on anyone else's data. The data that they have on their full node is verified by themselves without having to rely on anyone else's data. Um, bloom filters are, they're, they're really, really, really complicated. And oops, basically that's what it looks like. So because it's got a block header and the data, it will pull out random locations within the block header and it will say, does this equal that? Does this equal that? Does this equal that? If those line up, then it's saying that's valid. It must be valid. The information I have makes sense. And there's a lot of math that goes into the background of this that I don't know and I don't have time to get into.
uh, the memory pool or mempool uh, is where all of those unspent transactions out outputs or UTXOs sit once they've been initiated. So if I'm going to send Amber a Bitcoin, I scan a key, press send, and then it goes and it sits in the transaction memory. And that will sit in the mempool until a miner picks it up and inserts it into the block. At any time, you can go and see how many transactions are sitting in there. You'll notice if you run, say, a mobile wallet or most wallets that when I send you something, it shows up in way less than 10 minutes. There's a reason for that. A lot of them look at it as it will tell you that that transaction has gone through because it shows up in the mempool. It won't let you actually spend it or take it or move it somewhere else, usually until it's had at least one, typically three, sometimes six transactions or six confirmations based on your trust level um, and the risk tolerance of the service provider that you're using. And then once uh, once the transactions are confirmed in the block, then we go back to that Bitcoin relay network where it sends the block out to all the nodes, all the basically everybody attached to the Bitcoin network saying, okay, now Rodney sent Bitcoin to Amber, Joseph sent Bitcoin to Karen, Alex sent Bitcoin to Carly, and all of those will now, so everybody will know the update. So if we in this room did our 10 minute update, everyone would see that one move from here, one move from there, one move from there, and now we all have the updated totals and we all agree about it. Look. And there's, there's some really good Bitcoin and ICO related things. <laughs> so, what is a blockchain? Again, super high level. Uh, a blockchain is an ordered backlink list of data. So, every time there's, there's different schools of thought on what a blockchain would look like if it were a physical real thing. Some people say it would go like this, other people say it would go like this. And a lot of that's terminology. But basically, you're starting with a base or a base, and you're building in one direction. And all of those blocks that come after the first block speak back to the block previous to it. So the first block that was ever mined, the second block mined had a reference in the header to the first block. And then the third block had a reference to the second block. So you can follow that chain. And then if you were to dig deep down into the block and look at the transactions, you would be able to see that this Bitcoin went from Rodney to Amber to Joseph and moved around the room. Forks. Um, these can be good, they can be bad, they can be contentious, contentious they can be a lot of things. Um, later in the presentation, I'm going to make a Doge reference, and I will explain that at the time, but uh, Doge is a fork of Bitcoin. So here's your two major situations of what you're going to get for a fork. This, as it says, normal occasional forking. This happens quite a bit, and this example is in block zero, Genesis block, everyone's on the same page. Block one, the block is mined, it's propagated to the rest of the network, the rest of the network says, valid block, all right, let's move on to block two and start working on that one. Block two, two miners mine it at the exact same time. They both propagate valid transactions, valid blocks to the rest of the network. Based on where you are and what your internet connection is, which goes back to why the relay network comes really important, is because if Joseph and I mine a block at the exact same time, and I'm standing beside Amber, and Joseph's way over in the back corner and he's yelling, and I lean over to Amber and I was like, I just found the block. And Joseph's got to yell. She's going to be like, oh, Rob, you got the block first. That's the block that I'm going to start working on. And so what you've got is two people that mined a block at the same time, but this one hit the network slightly ahead of this one. Or this one hit the network where there are more miners attached. So if you were, say, in China, where there's a ton of mining, because Bitmain is there, then if you sent the block to them before this one did, then now you've already got a bunch of people agreeing that yours is the proper block. Eventually, you'll just move on to block two. 
there's a lot more complicated explanation that's it simple. The rare extended fork is kind of what happened last summer when we moved from Bitcoin to Bitcoin Cash. So Bitcoin, 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 and Bitcoin Cash. Now, there are a group of miners that are supporting the Bitcoin Cash protocol. And now the Bitcoin Cash fork is going to continue on this way. The Bitcoin fork will continue on. This one in the example just drops off, but it's not going to happen. Um, but that is kind of how a fork would go down. Is the other the other is old rules, <coughs> old rules, old rules, old rules, or old rules, new rules, new rules. And so with some of the changes that came to either of those protocols, certain miners said, "I'm going to follow this chain." Other miners said, "I'm going to follow that chain." And now we have two chains that coexist. Merkle tree. Um, very, very simple. Is a data structure used for summarizing and verifying the integrity of large sets of data? Um, it, it, it takes this much data and compresses it into this much data. And if you use the same amount of this size of data every time, you'll get the same output of this much data every time, which allows you to verify certain the SPV nodes or the wallets or lightweight clients all use Merkle tree because it takes small amounts of data to verify large amounts of that. So it allows you to take just the block header and verify that the transactions that you're trying to confirm are valid. This is my Doge reference. Um, back in, oh, I don't even remember, 2011, Anyways, sometime in the past, um, a guy named Jackson Palmer forked Bitcoin on his own and created a joke currency. And Doge was the mascot at the time. And it was really happy and fun and everybody was friendly. And it, it's, it's still around today. It's worth a little less than a penny, um, but it's got a market cap of you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so it's it's always been kind of kind of loved by a lot of the people that have been around for a while. It's mining Bitcoin. Um, it serves three purposes. The number one purpose is confirming transactions, despite the fact that. There are currently 12 and a half new Bitcoin in every block. What you're doing is you're actually supporting the network. Right now, there's a lot of power being thrown at it because there is potential to mine new Bitcoin. And I mean, you do the math, 12.5 times like 8,000 and change right now is, is not, not bad every 10 minutes. Mind you, you're not gonna be the one to get it every 10 minutes, but even once a week isn't bad. So it uses special software to solve a really complicated math problem, which I said before, um, 12 and a half new Bitcoin. It's changed every uh, 210,000 blocks. The next, so it'll change from 12.5 to six and a quarter sometime around June of 2020. And again, the, using the example of the room and updating every 10 minutes, the security of the network is increased with the more people. So if we have this room and this half here say one thing and this half here say the other and we're divided 55 to 45, then it gets really complicated. If there's a thousand people in this room, the chances of that deviation become smaller and smaller, 10,000 smaller. That's the security that you're adding with the Bitcoin network is that one bad actor, 10 bad actors, 100 bad actors, are less likely to be able to make some sort of altercation to the blockchain. So miners are responsible for adding transactions. The transactions come from the mempool, as we stated earlier, are inserted into a block. That block is sent to every other miner in the world, and they all look around and say, yep, we agree. The 
previous block is referenced, the nonce is correct, which is the solution to the math problem, and the transactions entered into this block are valid. So that means that the transaction saying, I transfer to Amber, Joseph sends to Karen, Alex sends to Carly, they all have the Bitcoin, they all own the keys, and those transactions make sense based on the history in the blockchain that we have. Proof of work, um, these are some of the really complicated words that get thrown around when you talk about proof of work. Um, so cryptography is basically taking one set of data and changing it into another set of data, very simply. Um, yeah, the, that's the nuts. So the solution that I was talking about that goes in the header of every new transaction, which allows all of the other miners to validate them. So again, we've said this a few times, the really, 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 really complicated math question. Um, it's it's a, a, a ever expanding random set of numbers and letters with a random amount of zeros at the beginning of it that when combined in the proper way will create the nonce or solution which is a specified specific list of uh, a series of data sets. And in order to solve that, you need to find the really long, uh, the really long solution. Then using cryptography, you change it into a standard set, and then it's verified. It's horribly complicated. And I, I still struggle with this on my own for you. Um, this was one of my favorites. I'll never forget this. I can't remember who it was, and I've been trying to figure it out since. But somebody posted on Reddit and Twitter and all social media that they had spent a timed amount. So they didn't sit down and work 24 hours straight. Over the course of a couple weeks, they sat down, and they started cr trying to crack this, this math question. And so they were using SHA-256, and they were doing all of the math that would have been done by a computer to solve the next block. In 24 hours, they did 0.47 hashes. A hash is a full attempt at trying to solve the really, really complicated math question. This is the amount of attempts that happen every second on the Bitcoin network. So every second, 47 billion trillion attempts are made to try and solve that problem. That shows the amount of, so when you hear all the things about all the energy that goes into Bitcoin mining and the amount of computer power and everything else, that's why. There is a extremely complicated question that needs to be answered and that's how much work is being thrown. The difficulty, so as I said when I did this presentation last year, there was about 7 million uh, terahashes. We're into exahashes. So every 200 or 2,016 blocks, they will adjust the difficulty based on the average time per block for the previous trans or the previous blocks that have been mined. They try to keep it around 10 minutes. If you all of a sudden tomorrow had somebody turn on a whole bunch of computing power, then the block time would get shorter because those questions would theoretically be.